right. Welcome, everyone. It's four o'clock by my clock, so we will get started here. My name is Karen Schaefer. I've been a master gardener since 2003. Master gardeners are volunteers. We are trained by the University of California Cooperative Extension to deliver science-based information to California residents, and in our case, specifically for Santa Clara County residents. Uh, if you're from somewhere else, you're totally welcome here. That's, that's fine. Uh, but if you have specific questions about your garden, there is most likely a master gardener program in your state or province or county if you're in California. And, uh, and they can give you better advice about specific gardening questions for your location. For Santa Clara County residents, we have a help desk where you can email garden questions and photos from our website. And we have recently started an online plant clinic on the second Saturday of the month where uh, we do a Zoom meeting type and you can have a face-to-face -face chat with our uh, master gardener plant pathologist Ann Northrup and you register for that from our events page same as you did for this uh, for this webinar. With me today are fellow master gardeners Pamela Traunstein and Louise Christie. They will be managing the questions and the technical side of things so you will uh, see from them occasionally on the chat, or the, the question and answer rather. So how this is going to work. Okay. Uh, before each topic, I'll be doing a quick poll asking you if you've heard it before. And uh, the polls are totally anonymous. So we, we hope that you'll answer each of them, but it, it is optional. And if you have questions, you can post them in the Q&A panel. Uh, please use that only for posting questions. If there are myths that you're curious about and you wonder if we're going to be uh, talking about them or you'd like to hear about them eventually, you can post those also. If I'm not covering them here today, maybe there will be a myths, garden myths take two someday. All right, so for our first poll, here we go, launch the polls, nice little practice one. So do you think you may have fallen for a garden myth sometime in your life? And let me be the first to say, I certainly have. I can't answer this poll because I'm the one giving it, but I would be saying, yep, sure have. Okay. All right, we've got answers from most people. So we will end the poll here. And uh, what it says is yes. You're not alone if, if you think you've fallen for one of these. It, it just happens so easily. Um, there are some things, you know, that we learn as a kid. There are some, sometimes there's a grain of truth. Sometimes it may even be that, that uh, scientists have learned new information and the recommendations have changed. So it's good if we can look at new information and update what we think and that is what we will be doing here today. So, have you ever, sorry, there is exploding interest in, in gardening, lots of information, lots of misinformation out there. I'm sure you've heard advice and wondered if it was true. Maybe you got some advice and you followed it and you can't tell if it worked or not. Uh, it's just, it's hard to know. So why is it important to recognize some of these garden myths, kind of get your, your antennae uh, sensitized to them? Uh, you could be wasting time, money, energy, doing things that you don't need to, that aren't helping, that aren't making a difference, or in the worst case could actually be damaging your plants or your soil. And if you have a problem and you're not getting a real solution to it, then you could possibly be 
you know, losing a growing season and maybe even making the problem worse. Besides which, and I'm sure this is one of the reasons most of you are here, science is so cool. It is so much fun to find out the truth behind things. So let's get started on our first myth. Have any of you ever heard the advice that you shouldn't water your plant on a hot sunny day because the water droplets will act as little magnifying glasses and burn the leaves? All right, so poll number two, here we go. All right. Got 80% of you have uh, voted. And yes, so 82% of you who voted have heard this myth before. So this is a fairly common myth. And I say myth because it totally is. So I moved here from Minnesota. When I moved here, somebody told me this. And, and I thought, oh, okay, that, that sounds reasonable. So I was careful to only water my plants in the morning or the evening and never ever in the middle of the day. But have any of you ever lived someplace where it rains and then the sun comes out? Yeah, look at all of those raindrops sitting on the leaves in the bright sun, not burning a single hole. And I moved here from Minnesota where it does rain all summer long and the sun comes out and those leaves are fine. I don't know why I fell for this, but I did, I did. So one of the ways that myths often sound convincing is because they sound kind of science-y. So in this case, we probably all learned about how you can use a magnifying glass to focus the sun rays and, and start a fire and water droplets do look a little bit like magnifying glasses, but this is a false analogy. Those water droplets are not little magnifying glasses. That's not how the optics work and your plants will be just fine, just fine with water droplets on their leaves. All right, so now some of you might be saying, but master gardeners and others tell us that the best time to water is in the early morning. That is true, but it has nothing to do with water droplets on the leaves. If you water in the morning, then your plants will have a chance to take up the water and be well hydrated during the heat of the day. Plus, if you're spraying water with a hose and it's you know, hot and it's sunny, you're gonna be losing a lot of water to evaporation. So it's more water efficient to water when it's cooler. But if you didn't have time to water in the morning and your plants are dying of the heat, then give them some water, even if it is the middle of the day. Don't sacrifice your plants for this principle. So this is a kind of sensationalized, scary claim. It has a little pseudoscience appeal to it, and it even piggybacks a bit on advice about when to water. So all of those are factors that often get incorporated into myths. All right, myth number two. Have you ever heard that if you spray a plant with an herbicide like Roundup, it could spread to another plant because a nearby plant because their roots are in contact underground? Oh, you know what? I forgot to share the results from the previous one. Let me just do that briefly. Sorry about that. So there you can see that, yes, 82% um, of you said that. All right, next, let's see. ask this poll. Here we go. Okay. OK, 
Okay, got a fair number of people who have answered. All right, let's end the poll and here I will share results right away. So I am happy to see that this myth is not as prevalent. I think it used to be more frequent. So maybe I will drop this in the future because if a, if a myth isn't uh, common, then I don't really have to be arguing against it. So anyhow, it is indeed a myth. Um, herbicides, scientists have done studies with thousands of plants and found no evidence that herbicides can plant can pass from plant to plant. It is true that plant roots can connect underground. And what's interesting, so this is that like a tiny grain of truth, is that disease organisms can pass from plant to plant underground, but not herbicides. So no problem there. What is also true is that herbicides um, can drift on the air though and affect a nearby plant. So obviously you would only want to spray, if you're using an herbicide, you'd only want to spray when there's no wind, follow the direction, maybe even use a physical shield to prevent it from hitting another plant. I sometimes just grab a piece of cardboard out of the recycling and, and use that. Uh, another factor in this myth, in, in some myths and this myth particularly, is that uh, if it's an herbicide like Roundup, many of us, many people dislike Roundup or other you know, things like that. And so it's a confirmation bias that it appeals to, that we're ready to believe anything bad that we hear about Roundup. And you know, there are bad things about any of these products, but we should make sure that it's what's true, not just what we'd like to believe about it. All right, next myth, here we go. Have you ever heard that you can tell the difference between male and female bell peppers by turning them over and counting the number of lobes? And we will look at poll number four. Come here, launch. There we go. Okay. I'm enjoying, I'm really enjoying being able to see this. You know, when I've given this talk in person, I get asked people to raise their hands, but it's nice to see a good count here. All right, let us end this poll and share those results. Not very many people. I am so happy about this. If you do a Google on this, you're going to find there's a lot of websites where people are saying this. Um, maybe it's maybe it's just a, a foodie thing and, and real gardeners don't don't believe this. So I am glad to see this. So right, it is simply it's it's not true. It is a total myth. And bell peppers don't have gender, and neither do tomatoes or beans or apples or, or you know any other fruit. Uh, what might possibly have given rise to this myth? is that there are some plants that do have separate male and female flowers. So the um, squash family, melons, cucumbers, they're all in that same family. And they actually do have separate male and female flowers. So the male squash flower or cucumber flower or whatever, uh, but the squashes have very large flowers. So this is easy to see with them. So the male squash flower has a long stem like that. The female squash will actually have a little, fairly large in this case, developing fruit behind it. And if you look at your uh, cucumber plants, you'll see this tiny, tiny little baby, almost embryonic really, cucumbers and same for melons. And if that female flower gets pollinated, then that embryonic plant will swell and become a 
squash or a melon or a zucchini or a cucumber. And if it doesn't, it may end up like that unpollinated one at the top where it looks like it's starting to develop, but then it, it withers and falls off and dies. So pepper flowers, on the other hand, are what we call complete or perfect flowers. And it has both the male and the female parts within it. It can even self-pollinate. It doesn't even necessarily need a separate pollinator. So, um, so just there's really no good reason at all for this myth. Next one. Have you heard that uh, if you plant a chili pepper next to a tomato plant, they might cross and give you spicy tomatoes. Here we go, pull. For some reason, my mouse keeps disappearing. There we go. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. Okay. And there we go. Share the results. Good. Again, I'm proud of you gardeners. You do know that this is totally not going to true. Probably a lot of you have grown peppers and tomatoes next to each other. And clearly, they did not cross. So um, disappointing to the chili heads who would love to get a spicy hot tomato, but it just doesn't work that way. It's true that tomatoes and peppers are in the very same, in the same very large family. Uh, that also includes eggplants, potatoes, but none of those can cross pollinate with each other. What about a sweet pepper next to a chili pepper or a red tomato next to a yellow tomato? So yes, if you planted two tomatoes next to each other, there is the potential of them crossing with each other. Like, I, like the beans, uh, sorry, like the, uh, like the peppers, tomatoes have perfect flowers and so they mostly self-pollinate, but they can be cross-pollinated also. But the results of those cross-pollinations is going to be stored in the seeds it is not gonna be evident in this year's crop of fruits. So if, if these two plants cross pollinated, you'd still see yellow tomatoes on the yellow tomato plant and red ones on the red one. And when you planted next year, planted those seeds from next year, that's when you might see the results of the crossing. And I'm kind of guessing Remember like Mendel's peas that the red is probably going to be the dominant one. So you'll probably get more reds than yellows and you'd have to go back crossing them. And this is why it takes plant breeders a long time to produce new, new varieties because it involves a great deal of crossing and waiting for plants to produce year after year. And it's also why if you are trying to save seed, you do need to isolate plants from each other. So we have information on our website about that. If that is interesting, oh, I forgot to share your results. There you go. Most people said they had not heard this. So that is good. All right, next myth. Have you heard that a spray made with dish soap and water is a safe and effective way to get rid of aphids. So let us launch dish soap pull. There we go. All right, I think most of the answers have trickled in here. 
Okay, and share the results. So now we've got a common one that a lot of people have heard. And the thing with this one is that it's half true. Soap does kill insects by dissolving their cuticles, so they dehydrate and die. That's how the soap solution works. But plants also have a wax coating that can be damaged. So there are commercial versions of insecticidal soap where they've isolated just the compounds that do this, and they've also developed formulas that will be safe to use on plants, whereas dish soap is not necessarily. Uh, dish soap also contains scent, color, sudsing, possibly even antibacterial compounds, things that you may not want in your garden, things that could potentially damage your plants. So if you're going to use this, um, I mean, my personal choice is to buy a a bottle of this insecticidal soap. It comes in a concentrate. It lasts for years and you just mix up a little bit when you need it. And that has been, that has been tested and is safe to use on your plants. So it would be a shame, you know, if, uh, if uh, you, if you killed the disease, but you also killed the patient while you were at it. So, so just consider that. Uh, but here's another tip. You could also just wash aphids off with a sharp spray of water. It's surprising how many times water can be just as effective as any other spray. And another, alternatively, you could just wait, double click there, uh, you could just wait for some of the beneficial insects to show up and eat those aphids. Here are three different insects chowing down on the aphids, and there are more out there. So we've got the lady beetle and the lady beetle larva actually eat even more of the aphids. That is a lacewing larva. Green lacewings are just a, a lovely insect to have in the garden. Go, uh, go look up green lacewing eggs sometimes. They, they look like little fairy eggs. It's very charming. And uh, they'll eat the aphids. That's a surfid fly larva. Um, they eat a lot of them. There are, are many more. There's a parasitic wasp that will lay an egg in an aphid and it will, um, it will eat the aphid from the inside out essentially. And, and uh, so there are just, there are so many things that eat aphids. Aphids are sort of, the, the krill of the garden world, everybody eats them. So if, if the aphids are in a place where you can leave them and wait for the beneficial insects to show up, that's even better than spraying with the soap spray. So the thing about the soap spray is, is that we have this feeling that familiar items are safe to use. But many household items that are safe for us to eat, to use, whatever, may not be safe for plants. There's a lot of homebrew formulas out there that call for mouthwash, hydrogen peroxide, alcohol, oil, vinegar, salt, baking soda. There is, there's a lot of stuff out there. And so when you, when you hear a recipe like that, do some research. That's something, again, your, your antennae should be up for that. Do some research and find out what, what, whether it's really safe, whether it's really going to be effective and whether it could damage your plants. Okay. Okay, so next one here. Have you heard that compost tea is a safe and effective way to fertilize plants and prevent diseases? And launch that poll.
All right. That's the majority of people who have voted. Here we go. Share the results. So this is a pretty common one. A lot of you, 77% have heard this one. Okay. Stop sharing that. So the thing about compost tea, so that is, in case you haven't heard of what that is, it's where you soak compost in water, uh, strain it out, and then you use that water to spray on the plants. There are formulas where you mix it with other ingredients and you sometimes brew it for multiple days, maybe using a bubbler to aerate it. Um, it's, it there can be quite elaborate procedures involved. Uh, there are people who have been studying this quite a bit they, the results have not really been that very strong, little to no effect. And uh, the scary part is that some aerobic compost teas have even been found to, to include uh, E. coli and salmonella, uh, human pathogens. So as you might guess, there's a lot of variability in what your uh, what you get from your compost tea, depending on what you started with. Compost is not a single thing it, it, because it all depends on what you yourself have been putting in your compost or whoever has been making the compost. There's a lot of variability. And if you read some of the literature, even from the, the very pro-compost tea people, who are studying it rigorously, they have very strict formulas that they try to adhere to to try to get different results. Um, I, I will say I personally did a lot of reading about this. I was very curious about it. And uh, when I read about some of the results and how carefully they were, uh, they were you know, careful recipes that they were using, I thought, you know, I just can't. I can't do that level of rigor. I don't know what, I, what I'm going to end up with. So in the end, I decided, you know, I'll just put my compost on the, the soil, use it as a, as a mulch or dig it in, and I will spray the plants with water. Uh, so there's a fallacy here. It's again, that homebrew thing that sounds like if you can do it yourself, it must be safe. And also the naming here, notice that tea. Tea sounds like such a nice thing to give your plants, doesn't it? So beware of cozy sounding names. If we called it Campus Exodit, it would not sound nearly so interesting, would it? All right. Did I not, I thought I shared the, I thought I shared those results. Yes, I stopped, shared it, stopped sharing. Ah, I see, that's what happens, okay. All right, have you heard that uh, wood chips used as a mulch around plants can rob the soil of nitrogen? So here we go. All right, that's most people who have voted and poll share the results. Here we go. So it's kind of a 50-50, a little more on the, on the uh, uh, more people have not heard it. That's good, that's good, but quite a number of you have. So notice, by the way, I'm not asking you whether you believe these, just whether you have heard them. So, um, and so the truth about this one, let's go to the next. So here we have a beautiful landscape, a lush, healthy plants, uh, beautifully mulched. And obviously they are not suffering from this wood mulch that's around them. So there's a tiny kernel of truth 
again, and this seems to be an ongoing factor that you'll see in, in a lot of these myths, there's often a sort of tiny kernel that gets exaggerated in a, in a wrong way. And so, which is that it does, it, that nitrogen, that wood chips do use nitrogen to break down. So they might be depleting the nitrogen where they're in contact with the soil, but they're not gonna suck the nitrogen out of the soil. So when they're on the, the top like that, on the top of the soil, they're fine. They're not hurting anything. What you don't want to do is actually mix wood chips into the soil because then when they're surrounded by it, they would be using the available nitrogen to, to break down. And, and you don't want to use them, you want to be careful around shallow rooted plants like vegetables and flowers. So don't use wood chip mulch typically in your vegetable garden. You're replanting those, it's just too easy to mix them into the soil. So you want a, a, a different kind of mulch for, for those. So a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing, easy to overgeneralize inappropriately in this case. So next myth, have you heard that using pine needles or coffee grounds as a mulch will acidify the soil? And we'll launch that poll. All right, got most people share those results. So yes, a lot of people have heard this one. It's very, very common. And unfortunately, it is also a myth. So acidic materials on the surface of the soil are going to have very little effect on the soil pH itself as those materials break down, as things are composting, the pH is going to tend towards neutral. So if you're growing an acid loving plant like blueberries or camellias, you need to do something else to, to add what the, those plants need if you're trying to get a really acidic soil. The, the pine needles and the coffee grounds won't hurt, but they're not going to help the way you might think that they're going to. So this is one of those where a common sense assumption, they're acidic, therefore they will acidify the soil, just leads us down the wrong path entirely. Pine needles make a fine mulch, you know, great, go ahead, use them. They, they break down slowly, uh, they suppress weeds, it's great. Uh, coffee grounds, I will warn you that um, you can put them on, that, that's fine, uh, sprinkle them in a thin layer, but don't put them down in a thick layer that they can actually become hydrophobic and, and just dry and, and repel water if they're very thick. So sprinkle them thinly, mix them with other materials or simply put them in your compost bin and let them compost. All right, next, this is an interesting one and it is I think it's super common, let's find out here. So this is a bone meal. Have you heard that you should add bone meal for the phosphorus to encourage root development when planting, especially for bulbs? All right, so we'll end that poll and share the results. Yes, so pretty common, pretty common. And the reason that this one is so common is because this actually used to be really standard garden advice. This, you, in fact, you'll still find it on a lot of 
official websites. Uh, it has a kernel of truth in it, which, um, but what is also true is that in fact, most garden soils, especially clay-based soils like ours in, here in Santa Clara County have sufficient phosphorus. Now there is something called mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and this, these fungi make a network and they form a, a symbiotic uh, relationship with the plant roots and they will, the mycorrhizae will scavenge phosphorus in the soil and bring it to the plant roots. If you put uh, phosphorus in the soil, it actually prevents the mycorrhizae from developing and the plant roots get bigger because they are forced to go out and scavenge the phosphorus for themselves. Think about that. You do make a bigger plant root because it's having to do more work. So it's not actually better for the plant in this case to have a bigger root. It is, it, it, I just thought this was so cool when I learned about it. And this is actually relatively recent that scientists figured this out. Uh, it's also true that in agriculture, heavily farmed fields can become phosphorus deficient. So that's another thing that happens is there's advice being given to farmers that's appropriate for agriculture that doesn't always translate well to home gardening. And this is another case of that. Okay, next, have you heard that when you plant a tree or a shrub, you should amend the soil in the planting hole with compost? Right, got a lot of votes in now. And that poll, share the results. So yes, a lot of you have heard this. And uh, we of course are always uh, suggesting that you use compost to amend your gardens, but we actually don't recommend compost for a planting hole. Because when you amend the soil in the hole, and especially if you have heavy clay soil, the way we do here in much of Santa Clara County, it's like you're making a flower pot sunk in the ground. And the soil, whoops, what happened there? Um, the, uh, the, the tree's roots will hit the edge of that pot, essentially, and not really want to leave the soft, fluffy soil that it's growing in and go out into that hard compost, or sorry, the hard native soil. So you can actually end up with tree roots that circle around, they can, it, they might grow really well initially and then they stop and then it dies. So it can be a short lived tree. Uh, in, in many ways, if you do this. Some trees, you know, it's, it's not a death sentence. Many plants are able to overcome it, but in general, it's better not. And it's also, hey, it's less work. So if you just fill it in with native soil, then it's surrounded inside and out the, of the planting um, hole with the same soil and it much more easily continues out into there and, and continues to grow. So that is, is much preferred. Have you heard that wood ash is great for your garden? Okay. Uh, wood ash. Okay, 
end that poll and share the results. So a good number of people have heard this. And this is a really interesting one because it is, uh, it is true depending on where you live and what your soil is like. So here's a pH scale. Uh, wood ash is a great source of potassium and other nutrients, and it is alkaline. So if you have acidic soil, it will help raise the pH of the soil. So that's super. And a great deal um, of the US does have acidic soil. Some areas in California have acidic soil. Here in the Santa Clara Valley, if you have our, our native clay soil, you have alkaline soil. So you are already on the basic side of the, of the scale here. And the last thing you need to do is add more, um, more uh, potassium to make it more alkaline. So, so you can get a soil test down if you want to know more about your own garden soil. Uh, so don't, don't add it if you don't need it because excess alkalinity is very bad for plants. We already, you know, we're, we're, we have, it's, it's lush here, but uh, some plants do struggle, especially again, if you're trying to grow any of those acid lovers, they do not like our native soil. All right, have you heard, let me back up here, oh dear. Have you heard that if you put um, a layer, uh, that you should put a layer of gravel in the bottom of your containers so that they will drain better? Here we go. Right. All right. Yep. Okay. I'm going to end the poll. Yep. All right. And share the results. Super, super common. Almost, almost everyone has heard this one. And here's what happens. I will say right at the start, this is a myth. This is a myth and I want you to go out and tell everybody you know that this is a myth. What happens is, and it just sounds so reasonable because obviously water runs through gravel really fast, but water, but soil, this is the part that isn't intuitive. Soil actually is acting like a sponge. So gravity is pulling the water down and the soil is hanging on to some amount of the water. It's drier at the top, and then it gets soggy down here at the bottom. And it's like um, if you've ever had, you know, holding a wet sponge and it's not dripping, but if you squeeze it, more water comes out. That's what soil is like. It's hanging onto the water. And because of gravity, the soggy layer is at the bottom there. I don't know why I'm doing this sometimes. Okay. So if you put gravel in the bottom of your pot, what you're actually doing is raising that soggy layer up a level. So you're giving your plant roots less room to, uh, to grow in. So, so don't do it. Don't do it. If you really feel you have to, you could put just a single piece of something over the, the hole to keep the soil from falling out. But even that, you know, the soil may only fall out right at first, and then it hangs on to each other. So don't put, don't put that in there, unless for some reason you want to raise your water level up. Okay. Have you heard of companion planting? Carrots love tomatoes. Here we go, launch that poll. Uh, 
All right. All right, I'm going to end the poll here. So a fair number of people have heard this. It, it sounds so friendly, doesn't it? The carrots love tomatoes. There was a book uh, called this. It's just, it's such a great phrase, such a great title. But the truth is that there's a truth to companion planting, but it's not what you think it is. Mixing plants together can, can help keep some pests from spreading easily from one plant to the other if you don't have all of the same kind. You can use tall vegetables to shade short ones. You can mix quick growing plants or skinny plants with other ones. So here's a couple of examples, radishes, with carrots is a classic combination. The radishes are really fast. The carrots take a long time. You pull those radishes and then the carrots are able to keep growing. And in the meantime, the radish leaves have shaded the carrots a little bit, skinny green onions. So there are combinations. Some plants will attract pollinators. There's all sorts of good reasons to plant uh, plants, different plants together, but it's not really that they love each other and don't get uh, bogged down with plant combinations that don't make a difference. So, Epsom salt, this is one, this is a favorite one, I think. Let's see what people think here. Have you heard that Epsom salts are great for plants? Have you heard it recommended for anything, anything for plants? Okay, good, all right, I'm going to end the poll here, share the results. All right, so yes, lots of people have heard Epsom salts for plants. So the truth is that Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate. So, so if a soil is magnesium deficient, yes, Epsom salts can be useful. You know what I'm going to say here, don't you? Santa Clara County clay soil has lots and lots of nutrients in it, including usually plenty of, mag of magnesium. So we really don't need it. Now, in agriculture, again, this is one where it can be true in agriculture, not for, for home gardeners. In agriculture, where crops are being grown intensively and irrigated heavily, yes, those soils can become magnesium deficient. So there's a good chance that's how this one arose, but our, our garden soils are unlikely to need it. Again, you can get a soil test done if you really want to know. Also, remember that myth right back at the beginning about, uh, about water droplets burning holes in the, in the leaves? If you're using Epsom salts on a hot sunny day as a foliar spray on your plants and the, the droplets of the Epsom salt solution are on the leaves and it's hot and it evaporates out, you actually can have some leaf scorch because of that. So. Don't spray Epsom salts on your plants on a sunny day. All right, have you heard that neem can cure just about anything? Oops, uh, sorry, I did the wrong one there. Let us. Neem, launch that poll, there we go. And I thank all of you for continuing to answer these, these poll questions. I'm really enjoying being able to see these results. All right, I will end this poll and share those results. So um, yes, a fairly common, almost 75% uh, of you have heard this. So here's the thing about neem. 
it really is an amazing substance. Uh, it can do an awful lot of things. It's a pesticide made from the seeds of the neem tree. It's been used for centuries in India and Southeast Asia. It's fairly safe, but you would want to take some precautions. You don't want to inhale it and things like that. It, it is uh, effective against some insects. It does need to be sprayed on the insects itself. It's, it, it is what is called a contact poison, it has to actually touch the insects. So um, in this case, we have an insect here, if that's getting sprayed, that's fine. If this insect comes along hours later, it's not going to be affected by the residue on the plant. Neem can also be used as a fungicide against things like apple and pear scab, um, black spot, but it doesn't treat everything. And that's the message I really want you to get from this is, you need to find out before you start spraying anything, figure out what your problem really is. If you're not sure, contact our help desk and, and the volunteers there can help walk you through diagnosing what the problem is and then find out what the appropriate treatment options are. We have an, a wonderful tool that the University of California has assembled for us called their Integrated Pest Management website where it it talks about different plants, different pests, what to use for different things. Uh, be sure you're looking at the home uh, version of it. There's also an agricultural version. So uh, once you do that, then fine. If neem is recommended, go for it, but it doesn't cure everything. And I want you to know too that neem is toxic to honeybees. So please, only apply it when, um, when the bees are not active. So that means late evening, at night, or very early in the morning. And it can also damage plants when the temperature is over 90 degrees. So be careful if it's in the summer. All right, let us... Have you heard um, that, that you should bury eggshells when you plant tomatoes to prevent blossom and rot. Okay, so here we go. Launch that poll. Kind of at a 50-50 here, yeah, okay, good. All right, so we will end the poll here and share the results. Okay, so there we are, yeah, about 50-50 for this one. So blossom and rot is, um, it is a calcium deficiency. It, it looks like a disease, but it is, it's actually a, um, a deficiency. And because it's a calcium deficiency, that leads many people to reason that if you add eggshells uh, when you plant, that should help. So I want to do a little thought experiment for this one. So imagine that you and your neighbor um, have heard this and you decide to try it. So you both plant tomatoes and you put eggshells under your tomatoes when you plant them. And at the end of the season, you don't think that it made any difference, but your neighbor thinks that it did, that it did. So what might account for your difference in the conclusion? I, mean, I want you to think about that here for 10 seconds, come up with a couple of ideas about what you think might've made a difference. Right, and now I'm going to launch, this is the last poll, everybody. And uh, this is a multiple choice one. So mark all of these factors. And, uh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to put in a, a uh, something else one. So uh, if you thought of something else, uh, sorry about that. So see if any of these factors are ones that you thought of.
I'm giving you a little extra time to answer this one because it is a little more complicated, more to read here, not just yes, no. Okay. All right, well, we've got about 80% have answered that's typical here. So I am going to end the poll now. If anybody wants to get their vote in here. Three, two, one, end the poll. Okay, and share the results here. So, all right, good. Excellent. Uh, so people, you thought about a lot of possibilities for why you and your neighbor, neighbor might have gotten different results and why you might have come to different conclusions. So that is great. And here I will stop sharing that for a moment. And yeah, so you might not have had uh, untreated plants to compare against. You might have faulty memories about what happened last year. Uh, there was no blind testing. You wanted to believe your neighbor, you both wanted to believe, but maybe your neighbor believed more that, and there actually might've been cultivation differences. So many possible factors. And all of these factors make field studies by scientists complicated too. Um, and it makes it difficult to draw conclusions about what is happening in your garden. Just so you need to think about this yourself whenever you try something and you say, did that work? How do I know that it worked? And it wasn't just one of these others. It was just a better year this year. It was just a healthier plant than last year. Uh, Blossom and rot, by the way, is a calcium deficiency, but it's not a deficiency in the soil. So putting the eggshells in really is not making any difference. It's uh, the plant is not getting the calcium out to the fruits fast enough when they're growing. Having even watering helps a lot. I think a lot of you mentioned watering. So I think you've heard that before. And it's usually the first flushes of tomatoes that have this problem when the plant is growing very fast in the spring and those first uh, tomatoes are not maybe not getting the calcium that they need. And certain varieties, especially paste tomatoes are much more susceptible to blossom end rot. And finally, Eggshells take a long time to break down. If you put eggshells in your compost, you know you see them in there for a long time. The eggshells you put in the soil this season are not gonna be ready for your tomatoes to use. All right, so we've covered a lot here today about how it's hard to tell when something's a, a myth. Uh, common sense can lead you astray. Uh, we, we like information that we get from other people. We sometimes value that more than uh, information that we get from an authority because our neighbors saying, hey, you know, this really worked for me. And you look at their, their yard and it's beautiful. So sure, uh, we love a good story. We love a good secret. We love miracle formulas. So these are all things to guard against. These are all things to get your detection antennae up and going and to check things out. So if you hear something that you think might be a myth, check it out with a good scientific source. Many university extension services have excellent information online. Uh, look for something that ends with .edu. I list a few of them here. Check your local Master Gardener uh, website, help desk. There are some great books out there, websites. Uh, there's even a Facebook group called The Garden Professors uh, where they, they answer all sorts of questions. And uh, there is a PDF um, on, our, uh, on the events handout list that lists a bunch of, of resources for you to take a look at. Um, speaking of the events calendar, we have a few things coming up, the plant clinic that I mentioned, and I am uh, scheduled to do a talk on January 18th on garden science, where I'll go more into garden literacy and ways to be a citizen science, do science in your own garden. 
So I hope you can join me. Uh, we are at five o'clock and um, Louise, I don't know, can we take any questions at this point? Oh, yes. <laughs> we yeah, I would say go right ahead. Go ahead, Pam. Pamela. Okay, so um, Karen, here's a couple that, um, uh, that probably are worth um, discussing live. One is compost tea versus worm castings tea. I think we might need a little clarification on what each one of those are and sort of if you feel that uh, your recommendation is the same. Uh, again, I would check. Um, so, so the difference is that worm casting tea is, is what sort of drips out. If, you, if you've got a worm bin, it's the it's the juice that drips out of that whole process. Uh, I have heard that that is an excellent fertilizer. I would just use it as a fertilizer rather than a spray on, on plants. And I would suggest uh, checking out one of these sites. Linda Chalker Scott uh, has that website, Horticultural Myths, the, the Washington State one there. And she has some really excellent advice about a lot of things. Excellent. Um, another question is you mentioned sort of um, can a pepper planted next to a tomato make the tomato spicy, but what about planting sweet and hot peppers in the same space? Again, they, you, they can cross but the effect of the cross is going to be stored in the seeds and you're not going to see the cross until the next year when you plant those seeds. There we go. Um, and then you mentioned sort of companion planting um, and uh, another um, sort of question is what about the recommendations to plant uh, or for, for not having things near each other? For example, not having tomatoes in the vicinity of beans or potatoes. There is, um, there's very little evidence that I've heard about that sort of thing. There are a few plants that really where the roots really do um, exude something that discourages other plants. That's mainly like black walnuts and walnut trees to a lesser extent have exude a substance called juglone that, um, that really does prevent a lot of plants from growing underneath them. There's some plants that are tolerant to it and but many, many things aren't. So if you have a black walnut tree that could actually be, the roots could be suppressing growth next to it. But within vegetables themselves, I've never heard of anything that is, that is truly a problem. Um, I think um, my, my understanding from um, the potatoes and onions talk though, is that um, the issue with potatoes can be that um, some of the wilts, et cetera, can end up in the soil after the potatoes have been there. And so there yes. can be, you know, but consideration for where you put potatoes more than the tomatoes matters if you want to have other nightshades in your yard. Well, right. And, and of course, plants that are in the same family can share the same diseases. So if you keep growing, say, tomatoes in the same place and, and peppers and, and eggplant, and they're all in the same family. And you start to get, say, um, a fusarium wilt or a verticillium wilt, it can affect all of those. And so you can be, you can be communicating the diseases that way, but that's not at all the same thing as, as one plant suppressing another plant. Yes. Um, let's see, um, um, I think I, there's, there's a couple of other questions. Um, I think we've discussed the compost tea, um, pine shavings versus pine needles. Um, uh, it's my impression that if we're talking about just like the chip mulch, it doesn't matter whether it's from pine or any other tree, it's just mulch as long as it's on top. Is that correct? 
Right. Um, there are some differences in, in the, the qualities of the mulch. Um, but yeah, chipped, uh, especially of the, what do we call it, arborist mulch, which is really just when they, they chip the trees and use that. That is, is a great mulch. It's better than bark mulch, which is what you could typically buy at the store. Um, bark tends to float. You know, it's, it's lightweight and it will float away, whereas uh, the, the chipped mulch is a heavier and it doesn't break down very quickly, but it does break down eventually and feeds the soil. Um, so really the free arborist mulch is often some of the best stuff to, to use on your soil as a mulch. Uh, but sawdust, you didn't ask about sawdust, but sawdust, that the very fineness of sawdust can make it more problematic. It's much more likely to, uh, to get dug into the soil. And uh, so be cautious about using very much sawdust on things. You can put them into your, it's great in your compost bin if you've got an awful lot of greens from your vegetable clippings and things like that, and you need a good brown, sawdust is great in compost. I would agree with that. Um, uh, let's see, um, coming back to um, another conversation that you had earlier about um, using um, uh, coffee grounds as an acidifier. Um, one of the things that I read recently actually is that there's some evidence that the residual caffeine in the coffee um, grounds can actually retard plant growth. So it could be great, not just as in this fire, but somewhere you don't want the weeds to grow, but um, potentially uh, a downside for the, the plants that you put it next to. You know, there's, there's always the potential for chemicals like caffeine to have an, an effect on something. Uh, all I could say is that I've used a lot of coffee grounds and have not seen any problem, nor have I seen any particular weed suppression. Coffee grounds actually has quite a bit of nitrogen in it. If you're using it in your compost, you treat it as a green rather than a brown, which seems totally counterintuitive because of the color, but it, it, green means high nitrogen source. And there's really quite a bit of nitrogen in, in coffee grounds still. Right. Uh, effectively so, cooked and water gets pressed through it with some pressure. So you would imagine that there's something more than just, you know, solids left behind. Right. And so uh, I haven't heard about any plants being affected by the caffeine. It's possible. Again, I would do research. I, I in my experience, it feels unlikely. I, I will tell you, if you get coffee grounds and you're in there breaking it up, you get, I used to get coffee grounds from our nearby Pete's and I would break up those espresso pods because those compressed pods were really hard. And, and if I didn't break them up, I would dig, you know, turn my compost and I'd find whole pods just sitting there not getting dissolved. So I'd spend some time breaking it up and I could actually feel I was absorbing caffeine through my hands. I felt a tingling. I, learn to be careful about doing that. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Um, milk and water uh, mix for roses. Um, I mean, I've, that's, if that's been one for powdery mildew on other plants as well, but thought that might be worth discussing. Right. Um, I, I didn't do research into that. I'm pretty sure I've seen that one discussed elsewhere as something that's not actually effective, but I can't swear to that. Do some research on uh, and some of these, these uh, the Jeff Gilman book, I believe talks about it and, uh, and probably Linda Chalker Scott would deal with it also. Jeff uh, was a horticultural professor at the University of Minnesota, by the way, and Linda still is a horticultural professor at uh, Washington State in um, Washington, yeah, Washington State. So uh, they know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, another question, um, you know, a, a comment that, okay, so compost should not be used in a, in a planting hole, and you mentioned sort of as it breaks down, the potential is there for something important like a tree to end up sinking in, into its hole, which would be bad. But um, does that mean that uh, no planting mix or anything else other than what was what came out of the hole should be used? Yes, 
Yes, just use native soil. It, it's sort of counterintuitive. And of course, uh, all, these, all these companies want to sell you stuff. So you go into the nursery and they're selling this planting mix for your trees and shrubs. And you look and you think, oh, well, I guess I'm supposed to buy that. But you do not have to. You do not have to. And you're right, Pamela, I did not mention uh, that. So in addition to that downside of it, it um, acting like a, a pot in the soil and preventing the roots from going out, it, it will break down and this tree or shrub can sink down. And that's something in general you don't want to have happen either. You want it to stay at ground level because if it sinks down, it's more likely to get waterlogged, have water damage, water uh, pooling around the, the trunk. Yes, especially in our clay soil situation. It, most trees prefer, and especially since many people are uh, required to plant street trees that are not necessarily native, um, and people may want a variety of trees in their yard, right? That um, most trees prefer better drainage than straight clay. So simply yeah, keeping so anything high makes plant it slightly high. And so having it sink down is really the opposite of what you want. So yeah, save yourself some work, save yourself some money, just refill with your native soil you took out. Um, and then of course there was a comment and, and I did, you know, is that you can, put, um, use compost as mulch um, around the tree as long as you keep it away from the crown of the tree once it's been planted. Right, right. Yeah. In, so in general, any kind of mulch you want to keep away from the stem of the plant, the tree, the tr you know, shrub, whatever it is, try to keep it away from contacting it. Uh, because if, it, if it's trapping moisture, it can, um, again, can be unhealthy for the tree. Uh, what mulch do you recommend for veggie gardens instead of using wood bark chips in that? Oh, you can use all sorts of things. You can use you can use compost. That's a, a great mulch, and of course, and eventually it uh, just gets incorporated into the soil. You can use straw that has some pros and cons. If you do use straw, make sure you get straw, not hay. So straw is the leftover stalks from grains. So that would be like wheat stalks or rice stalks or oat stalks. Um, and th th they're dry and they're lightweight. Hay is a material that's been cut while it's still green. So alfalfa and Timothy hay and things like that. And it's meant, hay is meant as a food source for animals, as fodder. So hay bales are like twice the weight of straw bales and they may well have a lot of uh, weed seeds in them because they're cut when they're green. So you don't, and they're more expensive. So it, it, these are all these factors against it. So don't use hay, be sure you use straw. You can also use, uh, I, I use pine needles because I've got a deodor cedar that is like constantly dropping them. So I sprinkle those on. Um, there, there's a lot of possibilities. You can also use things in the summer like black plastic if you're trying to encourage uh, heat growing, heat loving plants. Uh, I use black plastic around my melons, for instance. It helps heat the soil up and then it, it protects the melons, the developing melons, from being against the soil or mulch itself. Uh, so they, they aren't as easily attacked by, by slugs or other insects. So there's a, there's a wide variety of things. And we do have uh, material on our website that talks about mulch choices. Indeed. Um, I'm just gonna circle back a little bit. You know, we talked about like the milk water spray sort of, um, but um, the question uh, actually is, is it important to keep water off tomato and, squash? excuse me, sorry, I made a noise. Um, important to keep water off tomato and squash leaves. Like what, what are the benefits of, of considering watering only the roots? Well, if you water the roots, it's more efficient. So you're, you're not losing water to evaporation and things like that. So we use a lot of drip irrigation because it's applying the, the water very efficiently right to the soil. But think about it that these vegetables are often grown in places that have rain. So the leaves are getting wet there too. If you have wet leaves, especially at night, there's a possibility of, of some fungal diseases being 
uh, encouraged or propagated. It, it just depends on whether that's even something common in your area. But in general, we do recommend um, not, not watering, not getting the leaves wet right before evening falls if you have a choice about it. Again, when I lived in Minnesota, things got wet at night all the time. And, you know, for the most part, everything was fine. Uh, indeed. Um, sometimes it's a time of year. Sometimes you, you are great in the beginning of the summer, but the sun has moved and all of a sudden your squash is in the shade two hours earlier in the afternoon and, you know, powdery mildew just appears no matter what you did. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you're right that, that uh, having shade uh, does encourage powdery mildew. Um, interestingly, free water so it's called a mildew, but it's not actually, and it doesn't like water. So if you spray your leaves regularly, and it, it does mean pretty regularly, like you know, daily, every other day, fairly often, you can actually keep powdery mildew at bay. Once it started developing, it's really hard to do anything about it. Most of the things, most of the formulas for treating powdery mildew are really preventative rather than curative. And, and there's a lot of cultural things too. Try to make sure you're giving it full sun. Try to give it uh, good air circulation. Uh, but the older leaves, especially in squash and things like that, um, Peas, you know, peas are growing beautifully right now, but when the weather conditions become right, when we get warm, dry days and, and cool nights, which is really what we get a lot of the time, especially, but in the spring as it gets warmer and warmer, that's when the powdery mildew for peas will hit. And in the fall, that's when we get the powdery mildew on, on the uh, zucchini. I just figure it's telling me it's time for those plants to come out in the next season to come in. <laughs> that's that's my that's my feeling too okay i've got one go from way back from the beginning at four o'clock or so i was always told that planting should be done by the phases of the moon any thought on this oh it's that is really really common and i've i've um and I thought about including that one, but you know, as you saw, I had more material here than I was even able, uh, well, I got through everything, but just barely. Uh, th there are so many other myths out there as well. I know a lot of people who swear by that, um, but I've never seen good evidence for it working. On the other hand, if it gets you to actually plant stuff, you're ahead of the game. So if it works for you, fine, you're not hurting anything. Unlike some of these other myths where you can actually be, be hurting, right. plant your soil yourself. And, and if it, and if that, if that, that sounds like too much structure, that's okay too, <laughs> because uh, nighttime temperatures, daytime temperatures, you know, those kinds of things um, that can be so dramatically different from year to year for us in the spring, for example, are usually a, a, a better considerations for um, some of our veggie planting, for example. I will say that one lesson I learned in gardening is that it's better to get the plants in the ground than try to come up with the perfect garden. Uh, and it's, I, this is a lesson I continue to learn. I have some bulbs sitting on my back porch that I haven't planted yet because I haven't figured out the perfect spot. <laughs> <laughs> so true yeah. confessions from the gardeners my garlic isn't in yet either so uh, okay <laughs> we, we're moved on to the true confessions part of the uh, program here yes, exactly um maybe a little bit of clarification coming back to the um roundup um i do realize that many people um uh, don't know the differences between some of our really common herbicides and how long they last um and uh, for example, that um, Roundup doesn't necessarily last as long as some others. Um, you right. mentioned the, the, the drift um, consideration when applying an herbicide. Um, I don't know if you mentioned one, um, other ways that you could apply besides some of the spraying that make, you know, that 
that many of these package things come packaged to do. Um, um, but also sort of what happens when Roundup has been used in a space, how long to expect that it's going to affect anything in that space. Right, so a uh, Roundup only works on what it's actually applied to. It's, it's, in many ways, it is actually one of the safer herbicides because it will only affect the things that it has been applied to. It breaks down eventually. Uh, you can compost things that have been treated with, with Roundup and it will not stay in the compost. There are herbicides that do stay and will can survive composting. So it's worth reading about the, we, we have a, a reaction in general that we don't want to use any herbicides at all and all herbicides are bad. But as, as you said, not all herbicides are created equal. And if you look at, again, the IPM site, it will talk about the differences um, between some of these and how they can be used. Indeed. When I moved into my house, I found that certain areas of my yard had been treated with some sort of herbicide like two years earlier or, you know, based on when I moved in and were still uh, stunting or, or affecting um, plants. And I saw 2,4-D uh, that had been applied um, roll, you know, several feet away from the garden um, because that's where the water went. <laughs> yep, yep. So... Okay, well, uh, thank you for all of you for attending and, and for the huge amount of interest in this. And I will be looking at all of your questions and comments. And I, I did see a few things go past of other myths to be talking about. So, uh, so maybe there will be a myth part two here. Have a, have a regular uh, a garden myth busting. Uh, seminar. <laughs> okay. Um, very good. I think okay. we're thank you everyone. Thank Apologize. You. Apologies for any questions that we didn't get a chance to get to. Um, um, but uh, of course the help Please. desk is available and you are free to submit your question to uh, our help desk and Master right. Gardeners will still be happy to answer it for you later. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and, and good night. Have a great evening. Happy gardening. Oh, and water your gardens. We haven't gotten any water for a while here, and, the, uh, and the, our gardens are really dry, at least mine is, mine is so yeah. Okay. Good night, everyone. <laughs>